Hey, folks. I want to talk to you about ego. And this may not seem like it's divination. <laughs> Hi. It's divination related, but it is. Because, uh, well, let me tell you where it comes from first. It's just water. Um, I'm working on a new book. Um, so the Modern Fortune Teller's Toolkit, signed by Crossed Crow, will be coming out fall of next year. I'm working on a new book. No publisher yet. Nothing. Just sort of drafting it out. But I wrote something. I was writing a chapter on humility. Actually, I was writing a chapter on dialectics. And I talked about and dialectics are really just the idea that two things can be true at the same time, even though they seem opposing. Which is very um, important in divination. Um but in that, I was talking about ego and humility, confidence and humility. And as part of that, I was doing just some writing and exploring about the concepts. And I uh, had kind of a revelation about the ego that, you know, I, I wrote it and I was like this. It was like one of those moments where I think as a writer, I wasn't really in charge. I was just typing and something else was sort of <laughs> making things happen. That's that sort of inspiration that we as writers, that writers anyway, long for. And I'm sure singers, painters, you know, everyone else who does this, who does anything, loves that moment of like, you know, you're just a conduit for something bigger. Um, which sounds awfully grand. It's, it's not. Uh, but the ideas that were really important um, are important. And I, I want to talk about them because I think that confidence and humility are really important for diviners. Whatever you read whether it's an astrology chart or tarot card reading or bones or Lermond or palms or tea leaves or anything, there's a there's an interesting mix of confidence and humility that we need as readers. We need to be confident enough to trust ourselves. We need to be confident enough to listen to those voices that pop up and say, oh, this means that. We need to be confident enough that we respect our gift, right? That we respect our talent, that we respect our, our, our practice. Uh, and ourselves, right? So we need a certain amount of confidence. When we lay out the cards, we need a certain assurity, if for no other reason than if we're reading for someone else, to give them confidence that we know what we're doing. Confidence is good. Confidence is humble. Confidence has humility. It's not arrogance. Um, ego, arrogance, on the other side of the coin, is a bad thing. Thing, but I want to expand on that in a minute, and that's what the video is about. Humility is the ability to recognize that we're never finished products. We're not cooked. We're not baked. We are not finished. We always have something to learn. We should always be a student. We should always be exploring. We should always be growing. We should be learning about different divination techniques, different divination systems, but we should also be learning about things that have nothing to do with spirituality, that have nothing to do with divination, that have nothing to do with new agey stuff, that are about politics and liberation and ma not magic um and and uh things that are interesting but not our wheelhouse right like good you know if, if you're a writer learn about the guitar or if you're a baker learn about uh i don't know card sh card card um dealing cards right or casinos whatever the point is that in learning about different things you will learn a lot about divination too if you're thinking like a diviner and if you're thinking like a diviner that means everything you do sort of filters through this divination lens and there's a chapter in the modern fortune teller's toolkit which you will see this time next year that is specifically about thinking like a diviner but that's not the topic today um this is just setting us up for this conversation about ego what is the ego um well if you were to ask modern practitioners of, of, of YouTubery, um, you would probably hear that Ego is the Enemy, which is the title of the book by Ryan Holiday, which I have read. Um, and it's actually, there's a lot, he makes a lot of really good points in it. Like, I'm not here to, like, crap on him. Um, I do think that he absolutely approaches his concept of Ego through a very cisgendered, white, heterosexual male perception. His use of, um, like a, uh, I can't remember which baseball player it was. Anyway, he uses like one of the famous sort of um, groundbreaking baseball player, you know, who broke the um, the color barrier in baseball. Right? I can't remember his name because terrible with names. It's not. It's not that it's not important. It's it's my brain. Um, this is my way of saying I didn't mean to forget, and I knew the name before I hit record. Uh, it flew out of my head. Um, the use of that story of his story as breaking the color barrier is an awfully privileged example of controlling your ego um because he had to because if he didn't control his ego he would have not only gotten kicked out of the league probably set back 
the integration of Major League Baseball years, right? So not a great example. Very privileged to say or use it that way, but the book itself makes a lot of good points. But I take issue with the idea that ego is the enemy, and, and I say this through a lens of a few things. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. I'm a tarot reader, but I'm also an adult learning expert. I have spent 20 going on 25 years working in corporate learning and development. And as part of that, I have had to study the ego because adults have egos and egos are the main um, barrier between a human adult and learning something new. And so one of the things I'm always trying to do as a instructional designer is how do we, how do we beat the ego? How do we conquer it? Like, how do we slay this dragon? How do we slay this enemy? And I don't necessarily believe that ego is the enemy, which is kind of the point of this. But that's not uncut. Ryan Holiday isn't the only one who talks about this. Ryan Holiday is very famously a Stoic, which is a philosophy that I I don't really have an affinity toward. It seems to me these days like heterosexual cisgendered white men are using Stoicism as an excuse to not get therapy, to not deal with their anger issues to not deal with their toxic masculinity and that's not i'm not saying ryan holiday is doing that i'm saying that men who hear about stoicism and get a very base level understanding of it use it as an excuse to avoid getting better when what most men really need is a fuck ton of therapy i'm a cisgendered man i know from therapy um it benefits you so I'll just throw that out there again. And I, I feel shitty that I even feel like I need to qualify. Not all cisgendered heterosexual men, but most of them. Um, stoicism, I think, is attractive to heterosexual cisgendered white men for this reason, because it is a um, on the surface, a gritted out, tough it up, you know, kind of butch dude attitude. Um, and that's not particularly a helpful one in relation to the ego or anything else in life. And on top of that is throughout spirituality, there is a sense that ego is, is the enemy, right? A lot of spiritualities, including Hermeticism, including Buddhism, have a sense that overcoming the ego, conquering the ego, or experiencing an ego death is the way to enlightenment. Okay, and clearly some spiritual leaders have achieved that. I haven't, and I'm not a spiritual leader. But here's, here's what I know, right? And here's what I want to present to you as a student of anything, as a tarot reader, as a diviner, as anything, as someone who does anything where validation is key, where, um, uh, you know, ego and humility, confidence and humility go hand in hand. What is the ego? We don't really know, right? It's a word for something that we do, right? Freud and other folks noticed it and gave it a name. And the way that we use ego today is not how Freud interpreted the ego. Um, the way that we use ego today is really meant to mean arrogance. But arrogance is a side effect of the ego. So here's what I know about ego after 45 years of living on this planet, 25 years working with tarot and adult education. Um, human beings are animals, and we really enjoy forgetting that. We are animals designed to function in a landscape that no longer exists. We are designed for small communal living. We are designed to, excuse me. <coughs> we are designed to contribute to that community in specific ways. We, in childhood, wait to discover what our role will be, right? Um, in contributing to the survival of the community. Maybe we're a hunter, maybe we're a healer, maybe we're a parent, maybe we're all of those, maybe we're one of those. Typically, we would have one or two responsibilities in the community. I'm avoiding the more loaded word tribe here, um, but, you know, historically, that's the word that would have been used. I'm going to use the word community here. But what I mean by that is um, a group in a location, a small enough group, a mini society, right? A neighborhood, so to speak. We are predetermined by our biology to want to contribute. That's how the society, that's how the community thrives and survives. And in, at a young age, typically the elders would know uh, Tom's going to be the fortune teller of the community, right? Or Tom's going to be the hunter. Or Tom's going to be the bitch, the funny, snarky fool, right? That's not really a role, but whatever. You get what I'm saying. Um, 
we don't live in that world anymore. And we're not bound by society telling us what our role is and what it needs from us. But it's natural for us to think that way because it is part of our survival mechanism. And that's what the ego begins as in my learning to understand it. The ego is a part of our defense mechanism. And you know that because when you feel threatened, the ego is frequently what kicks in. How do we know our ego is kicking in? We get defensive. We get sad. We get hurt. We get upset. We feel unseen. We feel invalidated. We may also initiate arrogant behaviors as well. So we may get smug. We may get snarky. We may get attitude We may get nasty, cruel. You know, we may, we may turn into a jerk. Those are usually the ways that we know our ego has been activated because our body has sensed a threat and it has reacted in a protective mode. And our ego protects us from feeling in danger, except we're not really in danger. Um, we have just gotten some feedback that we don't like, or we have been invalidated in a way that maybe wasn't kind or nice, but is merely an invalidation. The ego today thinks of shame as a threat in the same way that our bodies think of a herd of oncoming bison as a threat. And it does that because it is part of our, our survival mechanisms, our fight, flight, or freeze responses. Um, here's my theory about why it does that. Because we live in a world that is not communal in the sense that I described it earlier, because we don't have a vocation or a role to play in life, at a young age, we're not having that assigned to us necessarily, although we might be, and that's, a, that's another part of this. Um, and so our brains start going, well, what am I for? What was I made for? Q. Billie Eilish. And then something happens. We get, we get societized, right? We, we grow out of our family into the world. And we discover Beyonce or Aretha or Renee Fleming, right? Whatever your style of music is. Um, Joe Cocker. I don't know. Where the hell did he come from? And we say, oh, yeah, that person's contributing. Because look at how amazing everyone thinks they are. Look at how society elevates and celebrates them. They are succeeding in contributing. That's part one of what's happening to us. Part two of what's happening to us is that we don't really have a vocation yet. And we don't really have a sense of what society is yet because we're a child. We just know what we see. We're, we're gathering context clues. And so we say, oh, that Beyonce is, is how I contribute. If I want to be meaningful to society, I Beyonce. I, I, I Aretha. I Renee Fleming. I, I Billie Eilish, right? Whatever, whoever you like. Um, and we absorb that information, right? That is how we have value to society because look how happy society is because they are doing that work, right? Look how great society thinks they are. Part three of that, and it's a thought that keeps floating away every time I go to talk about it, is we have basic human needs and always have had that are, again, biological imperatives. Food, sex, and safety, basically. When we look at a celebrity, we see them getting those basic human needs and more in spades, right? In, in excess. And so again, our brain goes, oh, these are imperatives for me. I need to feel safe. I need to feel loved. I need to procreate or I need to fuck anyway. And I need to eat. And famous people get all of that without worrying about it. Now, none of this accounts for the fact that many, 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 many celebrities are fucked up messes, right? But we don't know that. We're not thinking that way. And even as we start to grow up and we understand that, we still can't internalize it. So we have these three very specific things happening. We need a vocation. We see the world celebrating specific people. 
and we have basic human needs. And those three things seem to be wrapped up in the idea of success, as defined by celebrity culture. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, except that there's only one Beyonce, right? There was only one Aretha. That's part of the issue. Another part of the issue is that most people who reach that level of success today um, have managed to be benefited by a system of nepotism. Not everyone, but a lot of folks. But we have this marker in our mind, or many of us do, that success looks a certain way. And that we will only be contributing to society and to society when we have achieved that version of success for ourselves, right? The perception for folks who think this way is that they are arrogant, that they are egotistical, that they're attention whores, right? And I've certainly said that, I've certainly felt that, I've certainly been that. But that's not really what's happening. We think that that's ego. We think when someone throws a fit because they didn't get a job they wanted or they didn't get the record deal or, like me, I didn't get to have the career in the theater that I wanted. We think, oh, isn't that sad? Like, they pinned their whole identity to this thing and now they're upset and it's cringe. Like, what an ego. What an attention whore. But that's not it. The ego is interpreting this failure as a failure to contribute to society. And then it kicks into protection mode. You are not contributing to society. Thus, the society will realize that you have no value. Thus, the society will realize that you're taking up resources, not contributing them. Then society will shun you or kill you. Right? So that's what's happening when we fail. That's what's happening when the ego kicks in. The ego protects us. In the same way that the ego may activate triggers that, that come from our bullies. As we get older, bullies teach us about how shitty we are, how worthless we are. And the ego may start to remind us of that in low moments, right? And we start to say, boy, ego is the enemy. The ego is beating me up. The ego is being really mean to me today. But that's not true. What's true is that the ego learned in childhood that when you do certain things, that activates the bullies. And when the bullies get activated, you are in danger. So when your negative self-talk kicks in and the ego starts beating you up about why did you fuck that up? Why did you drop that fork? Why did you break that glass? Why didn't you do that project right? Why didn't you do this right? Why didn't you do that right? Why are you such a failure? Da 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 Stop being such a failure. Stop being such an asshole. The intrusive thoughts start kicking in. We say, oh, the ego is the enemy. The ego thinks that there's a bully present. And there is. You. But the bully isn't the ego. Right? You're repeating feelings that the bullies created in you. And the ego says, uh-oh, we're in danger. And the thing to do is protect yourself from the bullies. So never fuck up. Never make a mistake. Never fail. Never do anything that will make the bullies come for you. Because when the bullies come for you, then you're in danger. So the ego is not a separate part of you that is trying to make you into a pop star. The ego is trying to figure out how you're supposed to contribute to society. And it's doing that in the context of a celebrity culture that tells us the best, easiest way, uh, the most likely way to impact society is to have thousands of screaming fans. At the same time, it tells us that doing that is also a great way to meet all our other basic human needs. So the ego is just trying to protect us from failing at celebrity, weirdly, and from activating our bullies. But the ego isn't hurting us. I mean, it is. But that's not its intent. It doesn't have an intent. Its intent really is just to keep us safe. And it thinks that keeping us safe is keeping the bullies away. So it's gonna, when we fuck up, it's going to say, don't do that. Don't fuck up. Don't fuck up. When we fail, it's going to say, don't fail. Don't fail. Go be Beyonce, right? It's constantly afraid of experiencing these triggers that are going to make us feel like we're not contributing and then that we're in danger. And that's what the ego is. So it's not an enemy. It's our friend. It's our lover. It's our companion. It is there to protect us. It is our bodyguard. It will always love us. It just doesn't know how. And so what I think the solution is, is not to fight the ego, not to kill the ego, not to cut it off, but to retrain it, to teach it what danger really looks like, 
and that it's not dropping a fork, that it's not failing at a career, that it's not not knowing what your contribution to society is yet. It's just retraining it to think differently, to feel differently and experience our successes differently. And that first has to start with us learning to do that internally ourselves. We have to redefine success for ourselves before the ego will accept that certain kinds of things aren't putting us in danger. Do you know what I mean? So we first have to believe that it's true and then the ego will believe that it's true, which is why I have been going on a personal journey of redefining what success looks like for me in my career, you know, as a, as a writer. And now as a tarot reader, my goal is not to repeat the same mistakes I made in the theater that I did with tarot, where I pinned my personality to it, made it my mission, made it my reason for being here. And then when it didn't work out, um, after 25 years of trying, I, I get demotivated. I get depressed. I get down, you know what I mean? Um, so I'm in the process of retraining my ego. So I thought it would be fun to just sort of say, like, what's one thing that everyone watching this can do right now to sort of begin retraining their ego, to to rethink what danger really is, and to let go of the sort of self-flagellation that we associate with the ego, and that we associate with failing. And I'm going to do something I never do. I'm going to draw one card. Um. Normally I would draw three, but you know how I am. But... I thought in this case, let's just get crazy. Let's let's challenge my own biases, my own assumptions, and just pick one card rather than two. Or three, rather. So, and I'm not going to shuffle it that much. What's one thing that we can all do to start retraining our egos? Uh, the Empress. Oh, interesting. See, why I want more content, why I want more cards is because this isn't enough context for me, in theory. But I'm just going to let this be enough context. Again, this is the Supernova Tarot. Um, kind of a badass Empress. So what am I seeing? I'm seeing... I was seeing a woman uh, or a female presenting figure, kind of very open, sort of wearing underwear and a robe, right? Like, I can see her bra, I can see her undies. She's holding a shield, but very casually. She's actually got a magic wand. And then from her dress, all this fertility is growing, all this earth, all this flower, this flora. What do I know about the Empress? I know that the Empress is typically kind of, ironically, the card that I always used to call my Lizzo card, right? Like celebrity, badass, pop ass, you know, pop, pop, pop star kind of realness. Um, so at the, at the first level, I would say it's, it's about relearning our own greatness, relearning our own badassery. We start by learning our own badassery and that involves to a certain degree exposing ourselves because we may need to ask other people what we're good at. We may need to allow people to sort of wash us with praise a little bit. Um, and, and this should be mutually beneficial. You know, if we're doing this and we say, hey, you know, hey, bestie, I need you to wash me with praise today because I'm doing this work on retraining my ego. But don't worry, I'll, I'll return the favor. So there's, there's some element of relearning our own coolness because we're used to focusing or many of us are used to focusing on what we suck at, what we failed at. Um... She carries herself with confidence. And I think something I learned when I was still in theater, when I was acting, is that the way you carry your body will actually impact how you feel. If you walk with a confident strut, you will eventually start to feel that way. You can actually trick your mind into feeling differently. And so adopting confident postures can also start to retrick or retrain the mind, retrain the ego. The shield is there, but it's not being used to defend. It's being used to, to say, like, I've got this if I need it, but I don't need to need it. You know what I mean? I don't need to use it. So there's a certain amount of like looking for safety around us and recognizing that while we have defense mechanisms, we don't always need the defense mechanisms. Um, and then the magic wand sort of makes me think of just exploring our own magic. And so there's like a, a self-reflection on like, how are we a badass? How are we magic? How are we creative and fertile? How are we capable of defending ourselves, but also not always needing to do that, you know, and start rethinking ourselves in that way. Um, and that could help. So a little tarot there for you. But I hope that this exploration of the ego will help you on your path because to anything, really, of course, tarot, but just anything. It's, 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 it's about relearning who we are and relearning how to talk to ourselves, relearning how to protect ourselves. And the ego is a, is a, um, a trainable uh, part of ourselves because it learned how to bully us from our bullies, right? Um, it learned how what success looks like from society. We can, we can teach it new things. But first, we need to believe those new things. 
that's the harder part really um but that's that's one reason where divination really comes into play is like getting into shadow work a lot of people think shadow work is i i don't know i don't know what people think shadow work is i don't even know where i was going with that sentence but shadow work is really our ability to sit down and do readings or get readings about the stuff about ourselves that we don't want to face that we don't want to talk about that's certainly what freud was saying and one way to know where to start is to look at what we don't like in others the things that we don't like in others are typically parts of ourselves that we don't like as well. And so if you're not sure where to start, looking at what you don't like about others is a good way to figure out what you may be beating yourself up about. So again, not a psychologist, not a therapist, not a counselor. This just comes from like my life experience and and being a, a pretty damn good diviner. You know what I mean? Um, but this, this has been pretty true for most folks that I've worked with, and it's certainly true for me. So anyway, I hope that this helps. Take care. Be good. We'll talk soon.